Thank you so much, Dr. Rosada Roman. Good morning, one and all. Welcome to PSR Community Chapel, both in person and online, where we celebrate God's diversity of humanity in the world. We are so glad you are joining us. Please take a deep breath and know you are loved and welcomed here. My name is Barb Kraft. I speak to you from the island of Oahu, acknowledging Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are recognized today as native Hawaiians. For those of you on campus and remote, I offer you a moment to acknowledge the land each of you enjoy as home. For those of you on campus, oh, sorry. In all that we do to accomplish the mission of PSR, on location, we acknowledge that we do so on the sacred and unceded territory of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the Sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We are ever grateful for their faithful stewardship of this holy ground, which continues to support all we seek to do in the name of justice, compassion, and building a world where all can thrive. And now I would like to share a few words on our guest preacher this morning, Reverend Jeremy McCants. Reverend Jeremy J. McCants is a native of a little town of Sonoya, Georgia. He is a 2013 cum laude graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, 
receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Religion, and is also a 2016 graduate of the Divinity School of Duke University, earning a Master of Divinity degree with a, con with a concentration in Baptist studies. He is currently just beginning his Doctor of Ministry studies at Eden Theological Seminary. Since becoming a resident of Oakland, Jeremy has served as a minister of prophetic justice at the historic Allen Temple, leading the civic engagement arm of the church. <laughs> he serves as the Oakland faith-rooted organizer for the Faith Alliance for a Moral Economy, a project of the East Bay Alliance for a Sustainable Economy, an organization committed to fighting for e equitable and economic power in the Bay Area a self-described Southern gent. Reverend Jeremy McCants is the current interim pastor at Imani Community Church in Oakland, California, and is dedicated to the liberation of all God's creation through the life, love, and light of God expressed through Jesus Christ. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Jeremy McCants. Oh, 
the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. Some time passed. One day, the word of the Eternal One came to Abraham through a vision, a kind of waking dream. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am always your shield and protection. Your reward for loyalty and trust will be immense. Eternal Lord, what could you possibly give to me that would make that much of a difference in my life? After all, I'm still childless, and Eliezer of Damascus stands to inherit all I own. Since you have not given me the gift of children, my only heir will be one of the servants born in my household. Immediately, the word of the Eternal One came to him. No, Abraham, this man will not be your heir. No one but your very own child will be an heir for you. God took him outside to show him something. Look up at the stars and try to count them all if you can. There are too many to come. Your descendants will be as many as the stars. Abraham believed God and trusted in his promises. So God counted it to his favor as righteousness. Back peaceful. Whoa, easy now. I'm gonna be free or die. I've been walking with my face turned to the sun. Weight on my shoulders, a bullet in my gun. Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head Just in case I have to run I do what I can when I can while I can for my people While the clouds roll back and the stars fill the night That's when I'm gonna stand up, take my people made it 100 miles to freedom. Would you like to pick a new name to mark your freedom? Paratum. Early in the morning Before the sun begins to shine We're gonna start moving Towards that separation Hey! 
salvation And I'll fight with the strength that I got until I die So I'm gonna stand up, take my people such as this. Amen. Um, again, I'm Reverend Jeremy McCants. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here with you this morning to uh, Pastor Ann Jefferson for the invitation and to uh, the chapel staff and all those who have been instrumental in making these moments happen. To President Pastor Levy, uh, thank you so much for being here and gracing us with your presence. Uh, it's always good to see you, sir. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have also my partner, um, Anaya, who is visiting from Georgia. in action, amen. Um, as it was written in my bio, I am a Baptist preacher. So I am going to try to keep it to 15 minutes. <laughs> I give you my, I give you, you have permission to, to pull my shirt uh, if I am tearing too long. So. Um, the, the, the scripture for this morning has been read for you. Uh, very timely, a different scripture perhaps for uh, the theme of imagining as liberation, but I think it is a text uh, that will speak to us there in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, and the, the translation was the voice translation, uh, which is uh, a translation, translation that I, I love. Um, but I just want to call us back to that um, fifth verse there. Um, where God, the eternal, speaks back to Abraham. Uh, he says, look up at the stars and try to count them all if you can. <laughs> there are too many to count, and your descendants will be as many as the stars. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. If you will, just place your hand over your heart for me and say to yourself, my life matters. 
My experience matters. My imagination matters. My imagination matters, especially in a world where it is seemingly always right in front of us of what really matters. In a world where we are witnessing genocide across the water, in a world where black lives seemingly still do not matter, in a world where our LGBTQ loved ones are still pushed to the periphery of uh, access and accessibility and equitable living, living in the Bay Area where it seems like even those who have already been displaced are already on the verge of being displaced again. What really matters? What really matters? I love this illustration. It is about a celebrated Italian scholar who has spent his days and nights in his library among his precious volumes. And of course, as I'm at a sem seminary and school of religion, we all are familiar with libraries <laughs> and spending countless hours in the library. And one morning, this scholar was actually found dead in his chair, the light still burning in his student's lamp. There was no wound or mark of violence, no sign of struggle. But the cause of the scholar's death remained a mystery until upon drawing back the sleeve of his robe, his friends saw on his wrist a tiny spot of red. Then they understood the cause of his death. The red mark told of the bite of a venomous snake known as an asp, A-S-P, an asp. The scholar had opened up an old volume in which the small but venomous creature had made its home. And upon him opening it, the, the creature fell and bit him, which caused his death. What happened to that scholar, in some ways, in, actual, in actuality, happens to us sometimes figuratively, to those who defile the imagination with an evil word or deed. That sometimes as we are trying to uncover different accesses and different points of liberation and as we are trying to pull back the blinds off of people's eyes, sometimes there are some venomous things that can pop out and kill our imagination or kill our drive, kill our will. That, that if we were to pause and to pull over and examine the cause of death of some of our imaginations, we will sometimes see that there are some sparks, some, some spots of red that, that have killed our uh, dreams, that have killed our imaginations. If we ask, why didn't you pursue the first dream that you had? Why didn't you keep on imagining? And I believe that there are more than a few of us. If we pull back the sleeves of our imaginations, the sleeves of our dreams and the visions, that, they, that they, there will be marks of something that bit us and took away our dream and hopes and our imagination. Marks, marks of doubt, bites of doubt from people who only wanted you to succeed so that they could ride on your coattails. Marks, marks of jealousy and envy from people who wanted your dream because they were too scared to dream themselves. Marks, marks of, of faithless people, of church folk who would only invest in your dream as long as you serve God the way that they wanted you right. to serve God. Marx, 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 it was that theologian Langston Hughes who even said, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? What happens to a dream deferred through unrestrained indulgences of thought and desire? People are led into the shackling of people's minds and ultimately their bodies, leaving sometimes invisible and visible marks to our imaginations and yes, even our bodies. Because before an evil thing is done in the visible world, it is always done first in the realm of the heart. The world sees the outer fall, but not the inner fall. When people are overthrown by a given temptation, it is not so much this particular temptation that has overwhelmed them as the things which led up and prepared the way for said temptation. Ultimately, the point I'm trying to make here is that the reasoning for our imagination to need to be liberated in the first place is to acknowledge that our imaginations have been in bondage. First thing acknowledges that it has been in bondage, the invisible, the invisible marks, the invisible marks. And as I have looked back over my life and remember the times I was prepping to go to college and prepping to go to divinity school, that there were people who were sharing their visions and their dreams about what I was to do and who I was to be. 
they, they, they told me what they thought I should be doing and what uh, they, they wanted me to be. People I loved and adored closely and even people that I loved and adored from afar. Yet the conundrum that I think happens quite often is the vision of those who love us versus the vision that God has given us. That it is a particular kind of predicament where you are stuck between what God wants you to do and what those who love you want you to do. And I understand it's very good, especially when it comes to parents. We, we all have balance with parents, and we've been blessed enough to have our parents that we understand that every good parent wants the best for their children, but it, it is challenging when a parent can't always see what God is trying to do in your life. Or a guardian or someone who, who, has, who has helped rear you and helped guide you, and now you are saying that God is calling me in this direction, and, and sometimes it brings us to the re realization that sometimes you have to trust God all by yourself. You come to the realization that if someone else cannot trust God enough, that God will sustain you in the vision and in the imagination that God has given you. Maybe their faith isn't as strong as they believe it is. That if they cannot trust God to do what God is, is revealing to you, then maybe their faith needs some work. That there, that there are tasks, that there's a certain ethic of faith and discernment and imagination for God to do what needs to be done. That there are marks that we have to get over. There are bites that we have to get over. There are some people that we have to get through. And then there are the visible marks, the visible marks, the external factors of a toxic culture that impedes and it attempts to sap our imagination. If I can draw from the gospel of Toni Morrison, who said, to be white is to be American while everyone else has to hyphenate. Toni Morrison, who said, to be white is to be American while everyone else has to hyphenate. To be black and in America is a reality and a lived experience. It is in the words of Dr. Eddie Glaude, who says, we are not unique in our evils and our sins. Where we differ is our refusal to acknowledge them. That the major shifts of the country have been due to racial, to racial underpinnings that began to shift the nation to where white people would not be as dominant as they once were. What we know is that, this, is that the country has been playing politics for a long time on this kind of nature. It is easy for us to place it all on Donald Trump's shoulders. But this is us. And if we are going to get past this, we cannot blame it on Trump or Trumpian politics, for he is only the manifestation of the ugliness that is within us. That's right. And if we do not get this right, we will continue to have shootings. We will continue to have evils that will leave spouses, widows, children, as orphans, friends, the friendless. While we are trying to convince the dominant culture to embrace or imagine a future that will liberate them from being white. Which then leads us to the question of what does it mean to liberate our imagination? What does it mean to liberate or see our imagining, to see our lived experience and what God is revealing to us that we may not live to see? What does it mean to, to liberate our imagination? And I love um, over at uh, UC Berkeley, the other and belonging institute, they always preach the gospel that the question, the first question is never what do we do? But the, per the first question should always be, who do we need to become? Uh. First question is never, what do we need to do? But the qu first question ought to be, who do we need to be become? Your imagination should seek to sometimes defy, but to challenge your everyday person. How you show up every day ought to be living and breathing into who you are becoming, mm -hmm. and not just what you are doing. We are human beings, not human doers. <laughs> And this is what we find in the text. Abram has succumbed to such temptation that is all around him. His, his imagination and vision has been usurped by the realities that are surrounding him. Abram, who we first meet in Genesis chapter 11, although in this stage his name is Abram, there is very little biographical detail about him apart from the fact that he was a shepherd who came from Ur in Mesopotamia which is modern-day Iraq, after which he and his family moved with his father to Ra to Iran. In this polytheistic age, a nation of people believed in the worship of men and gods, yet within this atmosphere, Abram answers the call of God, and it is because of this that he accepts and realizes the reality of there being only one true God. 
than the liberation of our minds and the liberation of our imaginations. It has to be rooted in an inclusive view of who God is. That I, I know it brings up a lot of uh, controversy. It brings up a lot of, uh, what God, what are you really trying to do to be three Godhead in one? What does it mean for God to be God the creator, uh, Jesus the son and the liberator, and then the Holy Spirit? But I believe it speaks to the inclusivity of God. That God even understood that to show up in three different entities is to show the even triunity of what it means to be human, to be mind, body, and soul. What does that mean? What? How does your imagination live through all three? Mind, body, and soul. This is what I believe God reveals to us. So, so why does your imagination matter? And how does liberating our imagination simply live or uh, help us live into uh, creating a world where all are welcome, where all are free, and where all are loved? How do we allow our imagination to fuel our liberation? And I'm a Baptist preacher. I got three good points in the story, and I'm out your way. <laughs> three points in the story. That's all I got. But the first point there, if you go back and trace through the text, it says that, 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 that some time had passed and the word of the eternal came to Abram through a vision, a kind of waking dream. And the first part of why your imagination matters and, and why it fuels our liberation is that it is divinely ordered and divinely rewarded. It is divinely ordered and divinely rewarded that, that God came to Abram and said, do not be afraid. I am always your shield and protector. Your reward for loyalty and trust will be immense. That, that, that is in the words of Rick Renner who said, do not measure what you believe by what you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Do not measure what you believe by what you are experiencing. One of the most, um, I love this illustration, that one of the most grueling of all by super races, some of you might, might be familiar, is of course the Tour de France. The Tour de France, uh, uh, and a contestant in that event some years back, Gilbert Duclos LaSalle, describes it in, in, a, in, a, in a National Geographic article as the, uh, he titles it an annual madness, that this race covers about 2,000 miles, and he himself to train would ride over 22,000 miles a year. That's a lot of miles, y'all. I don't even know how many times that is around Lake Mary when you get to Lake Mary. <laughs> 22,000 miles just to train. And, 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 and of course, you would ask, what kind of prize makes people endure so much hardship and pain? Is it $10,000, $100,000? No, it's just a special winner's dirt. <laughs> Then it says, then what motivates contestants to, to do this, to train this hard for just a, a jersey? And LaSalle sums it up, he says, why? To sweep through the Arc de Triomphe on the last day, to be able to say that you finished the Tour de France is the gift. And we often preach about that in, in our Christian faith, in the Christian faith, that, that, that on the last day that we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, you have done, you have ran your race, you have ran your course, that, that, that the reward is what uh, you are able to accomplish through God, right? Is, is God the reward of your imagination? Is, is the liberation of God's people, is, is God coming to you saying, do not be afraid that I'm your shield, I'm your protector, and, and your loyalty and your trust to a God that has promised you that? Does that, is that reward enough for you? Is God the reward of your imagination? Or more than that, who else is liberated in your imagination? Who else, who has been othered even in your imagination that you don't think is deserving of liberation? As we press, we press and we understand that imagining that your imagination matters, that, that liberation matters because it is divinely ordered and divinely rewarded, that God says, do not be afraid for the gift, for the vision that I have given you, that, that to pass under the Arc de Triomphe of whatever God has given you is the reward. So firstly, it is divinely ordered and divinely rewarded. And secondly, what I love about this is that you can inquire about what God is inviting you to imagine. You can ask questions about what God is inviting you to imagine. It says it there that uh, Abraham's response was, Lord, what could you possibly give to me that would make that much of a difference in my life? After all, I am still childless, and Eleazar of Damascus stands to inherit all I own. God, what could you possibly give me? And that's why I love and I preach this, that God is big enough to handle our questions. 
that if God can handle the cross, God can handle your questions, God can handle your frustrations, God can handle your curiosities, that you can inquire about what God is inviting you to imagine. And I love, I love this. I had to do a little, little, little research, a little homework, and because I wanted to know who was Eliezer of Damascus. Who, who was this that he would name him not just as a servant, but we we know that the Bible often un leaves people unnamed sometimes. So it is, it's just to, to, to sometimes do some research on the names, but, but the, um, Eleazar of Damascus was um, a, a, a servant, but he was also the grandson of Noah. Wow. Eleazar was uh, the son of Nimrod, who was the son of Noah, and so thusly making him the grandson of another patriarch himself. And it, and it led me to believe that I always preach, especially during Black History Month, that as, as a live, as living as a black man in America, I always preach that black history did not start in America. <laughs> black history did not start. We were enslaved Africans, ripped away from our land, ripped away from our culture, our religion, our way of life, and, and that even though we were forced into child slavery and, and still made to serve these yet to be United States of America, that we come from a different history, that we still have a history, that we are still a part of a legacy, and that we are still a part and living the dreams of those who have come before us. We are uh, uh, manifestations of dreams. That what we have now, the freedom that we have now, was once imagined. The freedom that we have now was once someone's dream. So we have to ask just not how does our imagination liberate us, but, but how does it liberate all of us? Because in essence, God is challenging and urging Abram, even in this text, Abram, do you want to be a man with many descendants, or do you want to be a father of many nations? There's a subtle difference there. Man, do you want to be a man of many descendants or do you want to be a father of many nations? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. That we see throughout the biblical narratives that there are always questions, questions to the divine. And that is what helps us get through liberation. That, that is what helps us make sense of our imaginations. There was a friend who once asked Isidore I. Ravi, a Nobel, Prize, a Nobel Prize winner in science, how he became a scientist. Ravi replied that every day after school, his mother would talk to him about his school day. She wasn't so much interested in what he had learned that day, but she always inquired, Ravi, did you ask a good question today? <laughs> and Ravi said, asking good questions is what made me become a scientist. So as we are budding theologians, uh, theologians, preachers, I implore you to ask good questions. Ask good questions of yourself, ask good questions of your professors, ask good questions even of God. So firstly, liberating our imagination and our imagination matters because it is divinely ordered and divinely rewarded. Secondly, because we can ask questions about what God is inviting us to imagine. And then thirdly and lastly, is to always expect the impossible. Always expect the impossible. Go outside, look up at the stars, and try to count them if you can. There are too many to count. But your descendants will be as many as the stars. The breadth and the depth of faith that Abraham had in God is unparalleled. Can you imagine believing for God, um, believing God for something that has not yet happened? Can you imagine a world? All of the solutions that you wish to see as you drive through Oakland, as you drive through the Bay Area, you see people living in tent cities, you see those begging for bread and water, you see the unhoused and the unsheltered, you see uh, our tech brothers and sisters who are being laid off by the droves. All of the solutions that you wish to see in this earth, can you set a plan, can you set something in motion that you may not live to see? That is the depth of faith, that is the depth of our imaginations, that we are building something that we may not live to see. I'm always encouraged by the story of a mother who was walking during the Montgomery, Bo uh, Montgomery bus boycott, and as they were carpooling, and, and they were carpooled together, and a group of young folks were driving, and they saw a mother walking on the side of the road, and they pulled over, of course, to say, Mother, you don't have to walk, we have a carpool, you can ride with us, and, and Mama just looked back at them, and she said, I'm not walking for me, I'm walking for my grandchildren. 
I'm not walking for me, but I'm walking for my grandchildren. Who are you walking for? Who are you imagining for? Who are you setting courses of liberation for? Because this is what ultimately God is showing Abram, that even though you can't count them now, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Just because you cannot see it now, doesn't mean it won't happen. And I believe that this living faith of Abraham called and made, has made its path even through the imagination and the word of God. And I just want to leave you. I know that this is a cardinal rule. I, got, I don't want to jump in between texts, but I believe some of the words of Paul in Ephesians help bring this back to life. And I just want to leave you uh, with, with some words of Paul um, there in Paul uh, Ephesians 3. Paul reminds us of of, of being able to imagine and being able to lean into a God that gathers all of us back together that in Paul's litany in Ephesians chapter 3 he starts to reminisce on the very grace of God he describes it in a way that shows grace is made up of many different colors that the idea in this word is that great that the grace of God will match any situation which life may bring to us. There is nothing of light or of dark, of sunshine or of shadow for which it is not triumphantly adequate. Also in Ephesians chapter 3, he starts at verse 14. Paul begins to pray for the church at Ephesus, and it is a prayer that I want to leave with us today as we are gathered here as theologians, as, as worshipers, as, as liberators, as people who are imagining a better world. And I like the way the Message Bible reads here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It says, my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you will be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breath. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives. Full in the fullness of God. God can do anything you know. Far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah and Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Glory to all millennials. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Thank you so much. I appreciate that word and that challenge. Um, we had a song that's not in the bulletin. I suppose I sort of um, prophetically edited it out. Lord, <laughs> for today. So we're going to, we'll come back to the song, If You Believe and I Believe. Um, and we together pray the Holy Spirit must come down and set God's people Free when we imagine that which we may not be able to see. We want to invite you before we go to our work of the people. Please know that you are welcome. Thank you so much for that word. Uh, in our community ritual, it's going to be a variation on what we did, and we uh, continue to invite you. Uh, 20 year prison abolitionist Walida and Marisha first used the term visionary fiction. That's what we are inviting you to engage in. For the first time in a 2010 issue of Left Turn Magazine, where she guest edited a section called Other Worlds Are Possible. Visionary fiction is not utopian, it's any fantastical art that helps us to understand existing power structures and supports us in imagining ways to build more just futures. Visionary fiction demands us to be unrealistic in our visions of the future because all real substantive social change has been considered to be unrealistic at the time the people fought for it. 
With visionary fiction, we start with the question, what is the world we want? What are we becoming? Rather than, what is a when that is possible or realistic? Visionary fiction and other imaginative spaces are key to true liberatory change because we must be able to imagine something different before we can build it. And we have lived all of our lives within systems that tell us that radical change is an impossibility. So the prompt is, again, imagine yourself 50 years in the future. By some greatness of time and biology, you're still alive. Um, and social justice movements have continued winning and advancing liberation. What would your life be like? What would your communities of accountability and connection be like? And most of all, how are the world's children faring? So take just a few minutes to think about that. Just imagine. So appreciate uh, that illustration of uh, the woman who said that she was walking for her grandchildren. And our imaginations for our grandchildren, our grand descendants, our grand nieces, grand nephews, uh, grand siblings. Uh, for this young one who is among us, what do we envision the world to be like for him? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to go to uh, the work of the people. Um, Dee is gonna help us, but before Dee gets started, I want to uh, do a special announcement. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> so we are congratulating PSRD and student Donna Dee Lopez who was featured in an interview on NPR's KUNC series, Unseen But Everywhere, which is highlighting uh, the issue of housing insecurity among college students in Fort Collins, Colorado. Dee works with the Lutheran Campus Ministry Housing Security Initiative. The interview will soon be posted on the Ignite platform. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Um, all I can say is I only have one imagination, and that is that every place has a chance to live and earn an education, and no one stands in our way to stop it for anyone's child. With that, let's go with the... Yes. 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 So first up is the online cafe with Jana Cabanero. Navigating your, <laughs> navigating your academic journey. Let's get this my slide here. Next one or this one? Next one is Determined for Queer Christmas. We'll be coming up with the lavender lunch. Next one. Next one. And coming from the Body of Museum, it will be the women and gender in the Phoenician homeland and diaspora. Uh, more for talk through Dr. Aaron Brody. Fascinating man to talk to. I've learned many things from that man. 
<laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, the toolkit for the TOD for for congregations on transgender day of spirituality and visibility. And please, please, please make sure we see those people. Let's not lose people in our sight. Next slide, please. Building a hybrid, a thriving hybrid community. I'm part of that hybrid community, so please let's keep it going. Let's keep it growing. Um, it's on Yon Lung Cafe and Ignite. It'll be on Wednesday at 4.15. Next, please. And Ignite that download platform and app. It is important. If you need some help, uh, connect Dennis us to Roscoe. Um, email's there, but please do that. Next. If we have one. And finally, how are you thriving? Do you have a Thrive Partner? What's your Thrive number? Come join us and find out. Theological students needed. We have a study coming up. So please, the more you know about us, the more we can say we have a space and we have a voice. So please, if you have a chance, please do the study or see if you qualify. <laughs> and next slide. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dee, and congrats on your work as well in Colorado. Uh, good morning. You join me once again in giving thanks to our remarkable preacher today. Thank you. Seems like people are making their way west from Georgia. Welcome to Reva. Great to have you with us from Georgia as well. So y'all can connect. There's a good reason to move to the Bay Area. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but I want to also, uh, uh, Jeanette, do you want to introduce your son? Oh. This is my son, Matthias. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great to have you with us. Welcome, welcome. Uh, and I want to give a special welcome uh, today uh, to one of our newest members of our community. Uh, Gennaro Andres, if you want to say it at Gennaro, so Gennaro is our new HR specialist and business uh, partner and stuff, so he'll be working with us starting today, so we look forward to welcoming him and, uh, you know, to the work that he will be doing with us to facilitate our life together in work. Uh, I mean, just with a quick word, uh, Dean Abraham and I have, uh, with a group of friends, started to read uh, the it, the parable of the solar by Octavia Butler. There's a futurist uh, view, one of the earliest, uh, you know, we talked about her in an earlier chapel. So I just want to read, the, the book is set in 2024. It was written in 1993 as a future vision, dystopic vision of the world. And so I encourage you, uh, perhaps as your discipline or uh, on Black History Month to, and Futures Month to, to read uh, this and, or other published books. But I want to just read the very first quote that is in the book and introduces it as we think about the power of imagination. Prodigy is, at its essence, adaptability uh, and persistence, positive obsession. Without persistence, what remains is an enthusiasm of the moment. Without adaptability, what remains may be channeled into destructive fanaticism. Without positive obsession, there is nothing at all. May we be positively obsessive about creating a world where all can fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with the LS song, which reminds us that if we believe in freedom, you know, you may get to sit down for a moment, but we really are able <laughs> to rest. And, um, so Professor Lisa is going to lead us in the verses and our choir, such as we have our choir. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> 
Yeah. 